So it turned out we had a little bit of unexpected snow. Then again, with the Super Bowl and all that, maybe works out okay. Um, I've got a couple topics here I want to look at that I would have discussed in class had we had class on Monday. Uh, we're starting section 6.2. Of course, you had the homework assignment over the weekend to do a little bit of practice taking derivatives of natural log functions. And I would encourage you to take a look at my video about simplifying natural logs as well uh, if you're if you've forgotten some log rules or that kind of thing. Um, just as a, as a quick reminder here, this is not the central part of the lesson, but it's kind of the background that you need to know to be able to do the lesson. Remember that the derivative of the natural log function is just the reciprocal of that uh, inside function. So in this case, the derivative of the natural log of x would just be 1 over x, okay? Pretty straightforward. Um, the derivative of the natural log of x squared would be the reciprocal of that inside function, 1 over x squared, but there's an inside function. Derivative of the inside function is equal to 2x, and so that whole thing simplifies down after the x's cancel, simplifies down to being just 2 over x. Okay. Now, that's not the only way you can do that problem. Uh, you could also use log simplification rules, and you could say, hey, I've got a log of a value that has an exponent. Uh, logarithms are exponents. So I can swing that exponent around out the front, and I can write that as 2 times the natural log of x. And of course, that's just going to be 1 over x times 2, which is the same 2 over x I got the other way. So multiple approaches to doing these problems. Uh, there's not really a right or wrong way, but you want to be familiar with both, because you're going to have cases where simplifying makes a big difference in how easy it is to solve a problem. All right, so the introduction to the lesson is 6.2. The real focus in 6.2 isn't really on taking derivatives of natural logs. The focus is really on taking the antiderivative or the integrals of natural logs. And that's what you see here. I want to take the integral of 1 over x dx. Well, if you think about this a little bit, you think, okay, so if I have a 1 over x, what was the original function that I took the derivative of that resulted in 1 over x? And of course, if you think back to what we did a little bit earlier, it would be this function here, okay? So you would say it's going to be the natural log of x, and then assuming that we're doing an indefinite integral here, we don't know what the constant would be, so it's plus c. There is one small add-on, and this is subtle. You've got to think back to what you knew about natural logs from last year and in, in pre-cal. Uh, but when you're working with natural logs, one thing that you do want to keep in mind, the natural log function uh, looks like this. Specifically, the natural log of 1 is 0. Function looks something kind of like that. And as a result, you'll notice the natural log function is not defined for negative values. Technically, it doesn't have a value at zero either. So you can't just stick any value in here you want. Um, you can only put positive values in for x. And as a result of that domain restriction here, uh, when we talk about taking the natural log here, it's got to be the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. And so you're going to see that in each case. Um, what we're going to end up using this for then is really anytime you see the integral or the antiderivative of a reciprocal function, you're probably going to need to use this relationship. So keeping in mind the, the idea that we already discussed, if you want to take the integral or the antiderivative of the function 1 over x, the antiderivative is the natural log of the absolute value of x. Well, a couple things come into play here. Um, you may look at something like this, and, and in this case I have 5 over x, and you may think, well, you know, why don't I write this in a different form? Uh, instead of writing this as the integral of 5 over x, why don't I write this as 5x raised to the negative 1 power, and why don't I take the integral that way? I don't need these extra rules. And then you find something out here. If you think about how you take the antiderivative using the power rule, you're going to raise the power by 1 and divide by that new exponent. What that's going to end up doing is you're going to go up to an x to the 0, and you're going to have to divide by 0, 
and that's completely illegal. So the point here is our regular power rule approach doesn't work for the, these scenarios. And specifically, this is going to be cases when you have an exponent that's equal to a negative 1. Okay, if you have a negative 2 exponent or something like that, uh, you may be able to get around using natural logs. But if you've got that negative 1 exponent, okay, just kind of your pure reciprocal function, that's where you're going to see this relationship happening. Okay, so a couple of different ways you can think about this. Uh, in general, if you've got a constant value, I would divide it out in front. So you have 5 times the integral of 1 over x dx. And you can see here then that the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x. But we had it multiplied by 5 at the start. And then I need to put in my constant. So that would be my answer there. Okay. Um, example number 2. A couple different ways of, of thinking about this. Um, you could think of this as being you know, a function 1 over the entire inside function, essentially 4 over x. And you can think of this in terms of our normal antiderivative approach. Uh, remember, because there's now an inside function, I need the derivative of the inside function basically to be reversed here. Okay? In other words, to get 1 over 4 x, somebody took a derivative and they multiplied by the derivative of the inside function and they got this. So the derivative of the inside function is 4. I need a 4 basically with my dx to get pulled back into this function to be reversed when I take the antiderivative. I can't just add a 4 into my function though. I've got to balance it out here in front with a 1 fourth. Okay, and so what ends up happening here is uh, we end up taking the integral of this and it ends up being the natural log of that inside function, which of course is 4x, absolute value of 4x. Okay? Meanwhile, derivative of the inside function gets pulled back into that function. It gets reversed. Uh, and then we've got this 1 fourth sitting out in front and we've got this plus c. Okay? Uh, that could be one way that this could potentially be handled. Now, it's not the only way that this could be handled. Um, honestly, you might want to consider doing this a little bit differently. Instead, you might want to come back and you might want to factor out that one-fourth in the first place. And what that's going to end up being here, and, and this is a little bit strange because occasionally you're going to get answers that look like they're wrong but actually aren't wrong. Uh, I don't think this was the easiest way to do this problem, by the way. Let me come back and do it uh, a slightly easier way. It's the integral of 1 over 4x dx. The other way you can do this is divide out that 1 fourth. Okay, right, that is 1 fourth. Do the same thing I did up here times the quantity 1 over x dx. It's going to end up being 1 fourth. Do this red, I guess. It'll end up being 1 fourth times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Now, the thing here that tends to throw people off a little bit is you look at this and you say, now, now wait a second. Uh, before, you had an answer of 1 fourth times the natural log of the absolute value of 4x plus c. You know, isn't, isn't that a different solution than what you have here? And, and the interesting thing is, because of the unknown constant that I have here. These are both acceptable answers. It's very, very strange. Uh, if you remember your log rules, if you have a log of a product, you can break that down as two separate logs. You can break this down as one-fourth times the log of four plus the log of x. Not putting the absolute value on the four there because uh, it's already positive and then you can have your plus c. Well, if you notice, if I multiply this out, I get 1 fourth log of 4 plus 1 fourth log of the natural, uh, natural log of x plus c. Uh, notice something. That's a constant value. And so really, that would just change what that c value was. Uh, but in the end, it's all a constant. It's all kind of taken into effect there. So actually, you could have an answer either of 1 fourth natural log of x, or you could have an answer of 1 fourth natural log of 4x 
plus C, and those are both acceptable answers to this problem. So be on the lookout for that situation. Um, in general, I would probably go with the second approach there, and that is divide the constant out in the first place, and then you don't have to deal with, uh, with trying to think about these different possibilities. But just something to be aware of, okay? Uh, example number three. Once again, if you see something written as a, fr as a, as a fraction, as a rational function, uh, we don't have a quotient rule, per se, when dealing with, um, with dealing with integrals. So the way that I would encourage you to think about this is rewrite it as a reciprocal function, one over some expression times something else. And what you're going to see here is something very important happens. Uh, I'm going to rewrite this as 1 over x squared plus 3 times 2x dx. All right? Same function, we're just looking at it a little bit differently. Now I can clearly see, oh look, it's a reciprocal function. Probably going to have a natural log involved, that type of thing. Watch what happens here. This is really key. The integral of a reciprocal function is the natural log of the absolute value of that function, of that inside function. But remember, the chain rule applies here. And so, I have to cancel out that derivative of the inside function. Well, the derivative of the inside function is 2x, and that's exactly what I have over here that's going to be pulled back into the function. It's going to be reversed when I take the antiderivative. Okay? So, I needed that in the numerator because I had to have that x variable up there to be able to account for that inside function. So, when you take the antiderivative, this gets knocked out, you end up getting something like this. And again, if it throws you off, if you're uncomfortable about it, think about what happens when you take the derivative of this. It would be 1 over this times the derivative of the inside function, which gives you back the original function that I had in the first place. So you can see that that's going to work out and give you a correct answer. Okay? Uh, same kind of thing happening here. Again, rewrite it as a reciprocal 1 over this value times an x squared dx. Again, you've got an inside function that has a derivative that's something other than 1. Inside function derivative here is 3x squared. So I need a 3x squared paired with my dx to be canceled when I take my antiderivative. So, if I need a 3 here, I'm going to have to balance that over here with a 1 third. Okay, what am I going to get? I'm going to get natural log of the inside function, absolute value. This is the derivative of the inside function, which is going to be canceled out, which is going to be reversed. And then I have my one-third out in front. So it's going to be one-third natural log of the absolute value of x cubed plus 6. Uh, remember that you do want your constant value there when you close that out. Okay? So again, if you see fractions, see if you can write it as a reciprocal. If you can write it as a reciprocal, a lot of times that numerator is going to have something to do with the derivative of the inside function. It's going to look terrible, but in a lot of cases it works out really nicely.